to me from here on out. Well, I was born in San Bernardino, California. My parents uh, relocated uh, me very early in my life to Denver, Colorado. Uh, that's where my three younger sisters were born, Asia, Alicia, and Arlisha. We stayed there for about 12 years. Through that time, my dad was, uh, and my mom, they were both musicians. That's how they met, uh, performing in Nashville. Uh, they ended up working in a band together and creating a family. So. Uh, in Colorado, my dad continued his musical career and uh, got, a, got a lot of uh, local support and awards. Uh, and I used to go to those performances often, uh, cooking with him at his jobs, when, at his side jobs when he was working those, and uh, just kind of taking in that performer lifestyle, you know, uh, that, that uh, what do they say, the starving artist lifestyle. Uh, but my parents never pushed me to be an entertainer at all. It was just something that came to me naturally and uh, something I gravitated towards. I was, uh, I was into sports and things like that, and music was just something that moved my soul and made me, uh, made me want to uh, you know, get more involved with it and, and get better at it as time went, you know, progressed. It was something that just I wake up every day thinking about, go to, go to bed every night dreaming about. So. Uh, you know, that developed into a, a, a sincere desire to become a professional entertainer, and I started my first uh, uh, professional uh, gig with my parents, singing back up for Barry Manilow in Las Vegas when I was 13 years old. My parents got me the job, and um, the, uh, the musical director for Barry Manilow's production, because they came to Vegas every year and they would hire my parents, and uh, some people dropped out of the choir that they were using, which was like a eight or nine man choir and woman choir. And um, they needed somebody to sing uh, tenor, high tenor. You know, so my parents recommended me to Deborah Bird, uh, who was the musical director. And I came in an audition for her at 13 years old. And um, she hired me on the spot. And I performed along with my parents for the next two years in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, singing back up for Barry Manilow. So that was an awesome experience, uh, especially, you know, just having that be my, uh, what, do you, what do I want to say, like my inaugural experience into the entertainment field professionally. It was just like, you know, all these lights and people were there to see him every single night. He had a sold out show. And uh, just to see a, a, an immaculate and, and uh, organized and well-known performer be able to go out there and do what he loved to do every night was something that I really, it really hit home with me. I really wanted to do. From there, uh, after those gigs ended, um, I started my singing group in Las Vegas, and that uh, that singing group went through many evolutions of and changes of, of uh, personnel. But um, throughout the throughout the years, uh, it became the four main guys in the group, which was myself. Uh, Solomon Ridge, Ray Blaylock, and Schaefer Smith, who everybody knows as Neo. So uh, we were in the group together for the longest, I would say, the, the four of us, uh, for about six straight years after the initiation of the group in 94 that I started. And we had a lot of ups and downs. We did a lot of performances. Uh, we traveled quite a bit. We did, you know, I got us uh, signed up for Showtime at the Apollo in Harlem, New York, back in 97. Uh, uh, I got us on to uh, MTV's The Cut when Lisa Left Eye Lopez was still alive. I uh, got a chance to hang out with her. She was an awesome human being and a sweet soul. Uh, opened up for a lot of major artists at the time, Destiny's Child, Jagged Edge, John B, Crazy Bone, Karis One, Mad Lion. Uh, you name it, man. Like we were, we were working. Uh, we had a lot of independent record deals and a lot of independent mess. Uh, I almost said messengers, but <laughs> a lot of independent managers, and nothing ever really came from our efforts. So uh, the group ended up disbanding behind some uh, disagreements about things, and uh, everybody kind of went their separate ways.
Schaefer went on to start writing uh, for people like Mario and uh, Rihanna when they were, you know, first coming out, uh, Miguel, and uh, we had had other writing uh, opportunities for other artists that came out on Hollywood Records while we were still in the group. So that's kind of what started us down our writing foray into the uh, industry was uh, writing songs for, uh, uh, what was that group called? Uh, uh, Youngstown. They were a uh, pop group that was on Hollywood Records and we wrote a few songs for them. And uh, he just kept with it, you know, like as far as uh, plugging away at, at just the writing thing, he kind of gave up on doing the artist thing for a while. So. It was uh, it was cool to see him, you know, get the success that he had. You know what I'm saying, and and that uh, he continued to have afterwards once he uh, decided that he wanted to get back into being an artist. I went on and did my stint on uh, American Idol, and uh, got pretty far in the production until my unceremonious uh, uh, removal from the uh, program and the production. Uh, I went on after that to uh, uh, land a distribution deal with Universal Records and Bungalow Records. Uh, distribution deal, the, the distinction between that and a record deal is that a record deal, you basically have no control, but the label's paying for everything. You get a nice advance, and um, you, know, you, you essentially do what you're told. Uh, distribution deal, uh, you have all the creative control, but you also have more responsibility when it comes to marketing and promoting your, your project as well. Uh, you retain a lion's share of the royalties, uh, profits as I can say, if you do a distribution yourself, but it's a lot more elbow grease and work that goes into doing it that way. So doing that as a young kid, it, you know, I, I was not aware of that I knew I had creative control because that's what I was told, but I didn't understand that I was responsible for marketing and promoting the record, you know. So uh, contractually, I uh, did not handle my business and my team and I, I just had people around me that I felt I could trust at the time because it was hard to trust people after coming off of television the way that I was being approached. So uh, the people I had around me were not necessarily uh, savvy in the music business side of the business either. So uh, there's a lot of things that slipped through the cracks and the main thing was uh, marketing and promotion. So we had a great record, great product, had a lot of awesome uh, featured artists and mega producers at the time on the project. And uh, it just, it did not do well. That, you know, nobody knew it was available. Uh, I always say that I could have, you know, I could have had all the great dead legendary artists, Donny Hathaway, Jimi Hendrix, you know, now Michael Jackson and Prince on the record, uh, Whitney Houston, and if it's not marketed and promoted, nobody's gonna know that it's available. They're not gonna go pick it up. things I had to take care of and just get straight in my personal life and in my career. 
in between 2005 and now, and uh, it took a while, but uh, I, I, I decided that uh, I still had some, uh, some uh, performing and connecting left in me to do with, uh, with the people out there. there people are they're, uh, hurting for good music, so uh, I decided to get back into it, and I got a new management firm, uh, Honey Bee Productions, and uh, they, she, I should say, really helped me uh, just turn things around and, and get things in my career and personal life back in order. Um, so now I've got a, a, a two-year uh, distribution deal with Sony and the Orchard. I've released a couple of singles so far through that uh, distribution deal. That's uh, Color Me, one, two, and three, um, different versions of that song. And then also uh, uh, Naughty Boy, we just released uh, as well. Uh, I did a song a couple years ago with uh, Philip Johnson from the uh, from the R&B group called Portrait, and um, that was a duet that we did called uh, "Love's Melody" that I released a few years uh, back through uh, iTunes, and um, that was produced by Michelangelo Salisbury, who also was in the group Portrait with uh, Philip. So. Uh, they worked on the first album with me. They did a chance to dance with me on the first album, and we had such a great working chemistry together uh, that we wanted to do another another project. So uh, we jumped off on Love's Melody, and it's a it's a fantastic just love ballad, in my opinion. Like you could you can get married to it today, you can get married to it in a hundred years. You know, it's 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 music. It's timeless, basically. So. I'm not really, uh, I'm not, I've never been the type of artist to do the fad or the trend, what's happening now. I've, I've always just stayed in my own lane and done my own thing. I don't rap, so I don't try to do it. I leave that up to the rappers. I don't produce, so I don't try to do it. I leave that up to the producers. But when you got a good team of people around you and people that are hungry and want to work, the product that we can create is amazing. And I'm really happy with the new stuff that we're putting out now uh, through SM1 and Sony Music in the Orchard. I'm excited for the album that's coming out. This will officially be my second studio album. Um, most of it was produced by Stan Washington. We call him Stantronic. Uh, he just passed away last year, 49 years old. So uh, the rest of the team, Tommy Dorsey, Kyle Ginther, uh, you know, all the production cats we got, Davey Brown, uh, uh, Chris Halo, you know, Chris Golightly. Like, we're all just getting together and making sure that that project is completed because when Stanley passed away, it was it was left uncompleted, but about 75 percent. So, um, in honor of him and his family, because he's got a wonderful family uh, that treated me like family and like gold, we wanted to make sure that we got that project done and that we got a release. We got a, a deal with uh, Roku uh, to uh, uh, do our talk show, so it's going to be called Honey and the Bee. And uh, it's just a variety talk show about, about uh, current events, you know, entertainment, sports, politics, stuff like that. You're going to get a cool, informal spin on those types of things. And uh, hopefully people will enjoy that. And uh, trying to uh, pitch this uh, uh, pr uh, production deal to uh, Hulu and Netflix for uh, the movie about uh, my story and my life that, that we've got a 429 page manuscript basically for so a lot of things are in the works and I'm just proud of my team to you know keep pushing during these hard times as you can see I'm still masked up everybody here is masked up because uh, we're you know trying to keep it safe with this COVID stuff so that's made it difficult for everybody but that's no reason to just lay down you know everybody's still getting it on you know um, uh, Fabutainment's out here came all the way out to LA you know come out and inter you know interview me you know what I'm saying so we can't just lay down. We gotta, we gotta do what we gotta do, but we gotta do it safely. You know, it's better to be safe than sorry. So, um, in these trying times, it's it's uh, been a little bit difficult to keep things going. I lost about 70 shows, performances, gigs this year that were pre-booked. But um, in light of that, we've made more administrative moves to make sure that when 2021 comes around and things open back up, that we're able to start making bigger moves. Um, so I'm very very thankful for the time off, even though uh, you know we lost gigs, we gained perspective with uh, where we're trying to go in the future, and um, I think that the future looks bright for us.
Thank you, first and foremost, uh, to the fans for that, that have been sticking around. You know, I, there's, there's some folks that uh, have been rocking with me since they first heard my name in, in uh, 2002. That's a lifetime ago. There's some folks alive now that weren't even alive back then. You know what I'm saying? And um, that's the bridge I'm trying to, uh, that's the gap I'm trying to bridge, I should say, between the age groups of fans that have, uh, that have continued to rock with me. So I, I have a lot of love and I'm very grateful to you guys for continuing to rock with me and, and always looking out for my new projects and things that I'm doing performance-wise or otherwise. And to all the new fans that I'm, uh, uh, you know, picking up along the way, the people that, you know, really never heard my name or never heard anything adverse about me, they just hear my voice for the first time, you know, this little 18 or 19 year old, and they're like, wow, that guy can sing. So, you know, hello and thank, thank you to you folks and uh, guys and gals for, for uh, you know, supporting me and following me and uh, promoting my stuff when it comes out, putting it up on your pages, sharing it. This is all like a new foray for me because the last time I put out an album, none of these tools were at our disposal for there to be like peer-to-peer -peer sharing in the manner in which we have available to us today. So I'm very thankful to all you guys for continuing to rock with me and for all you new guys that just started to rock with me. Um, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, we're coming up with uh, what I believe to be the best material I possibly can to uh, keep you guys entertained and to connect with everybody and just let you know whatever you're going through, you know, I've either gone through myself or I've known somebody that has. And so I'm striving to uh, just connect with people and get good music back out there again. And, and um, I want to thank uh, Fabutainment for having me, of course, because uh, this is part of keeping me out there is, uh, having great uh, outlets like yours coming through and talking to the artists and stuff that aren't necessarily on top right now at the time, but uh, maybe at one point in time we, we were. So thank you for uh, thinking of me and having me. And uh, I, I wanna say hello to the Fabutainment audience out there. And make sure you go out and check out Naughty Boy. It's available on all platforms worldwide, digitally, uh, Arangami, um, or what's the other ones, uh, KK Box, uh, Apple Music, uh, Amazon, uh, you, you name it. It's a Spotify, Pandora, it's everywhere. So Corey Clark, Naughty Boy, featuring Casper Red Sun. Uh, Corey Clark, Color Me. There's a music video for Color Me that we got out, uh, directed by uh, Derek Mateo. It's a good video, got a good message behind it. And uh, just please just keep a lookout for all the projects because we got a lot of stuff coming your guys' way. It's going to be a lot of fun. and. Uh, entertaining stuff for you guys so uh, we hope that everybody enjoys it and we're gonna keep working <laughs>